I was born in Nottingham. I up my duck, got up onto your mother. Uh, you get out on it, youth. Keep on course, eh? Oh, it's a great, one of the great accents of the world. If they want to say in the Nottinghamshire dialect, please come inside and finish your meal, what they actually say is, come on in out on it and get it at up. It's wonderful, isn't it? Anyway, I was born there in Nottingham, in uh, an area called West Bridgeford, known locally as Bread and Lard Island, because they reckoned that um, everybody was trying to be what they weren't. They were. Oh, you can vouch for that, can you? I can try. Uh, yes, you can. And... Uh, I was born in 5 Victoria Road, West Bridgeford, on the 6th of February 1933. What did your dad do, Leslie? Well, he was an actor, uh, or had been an actor. He, was, he had been a character actor in uh, reviews and in concert parties and in sketches and God knows what. But he'd also uh, decided, before I was born, when he married my mother, it was the second marriage for my father, and when, when he married my mother, whom he, he met at Leon C in a repertory company when she was a part of the stage direct and uh, part of the thing, uh, they decided that uh, when the talkies and the movies came in, that there would be no live theatre anymore. It was the sort of same mistake that uh, the Hollywood producer made when he turned down Gone with the Wind because he thought the public wouldn't want another war picture, you know. But, uh, they left show business, and he became a civil servant. What he actually became was a sorting clerk in the general post office in Nottingham. And then he, uh, they acquired a, a conf tob, a confectioner's tobacconist, and sub post office, 57 Wilder Crescent East of the Meadows in Nottingham. And we moved to there, and uh, that was how I spent my early years. And brothers and sisters? Have I none? Were you spoiled? I was as spoiled as a, as a poverty-stricken family could possibly try to spoil me because we had no money at all. Yes, they did spoil me. Let's talk first about your early education and where. Let's... My early education? <laughs> oh, Miss Shatford. And that is true. I promise you, she should have changed it by Deepole, but that was her name. Miss Shatford <laughs> ran a school, a kindergarten in West Bridgeford in Nottingham, to which I went in the 30s. Then I went to the West Bridgeford Modern School, now called the West Bridgeford Grammar School. And then, uh, during the war, I went to uh, the prep school of the Nottingham High School, when I placed there. And then I was a sort of scholarship to the high school Nottingham prep department. And then the, uh, the high school uh, senior department. Uh, then after that we moved to London. Let's stay in Nottingham just for the time being and talk about early ambitions, if you had any. Yes, I did. Um, because my mother, who had two sisters, uh, had one of those sisters who had married very successfully for the umpteenth time. And I just really struck oil this time because she'd married a, a guy <laughs> called Fraser Wood, uh, and who obviously not only would but did. Uh, Fraser Wood, who was um, an estate agent, auctioneer and valuer, and it's a very f uh, well-known name, in Walsall, in the West Midlands. And uh, we used to go over to Walsall at Easter time for the Easter holidays, from our, by then, uh, poverty-stricken home in the Meadows, which was a, a, not a very upmarket area in those days. And... Uh, I'm glad you went on to say that. Oh, I, well, yes, indeed, because, of course, it has uh, brightened up considerably since then. Soon after we left, I think. <laughs> but, uh, was that by accident or not? Uh, I don't know, probably design, thankfulness and the prayers of the local populace. But uh, we used to go there for Easter, and, and uh, Great Uncle Fraser, being of, uh, uh, to us, immense wealth in those days, had uh, a huge Queen Anne house called Spring Hill. And one of the things that he made a lot of money out of was being an auctioneer. And I swore, looking round this enormous, many-bedroomed house with these enormous Queen Anne rooms, that I was going to be an auctioneer. So that was an early ambition. But that one was not uh, pursued to any great extent, obviously. What about, talk to us about the early music study you made. Oh, right. Well, uh, my mother, who was very musical, uh, and bless her heart, did, did everything that she possibly could to encourage me in music and drama and the arts, or an appreciation of them. And in a very tangible way, I mean, we used to go to the theatre a lot, uh, the Theatre Royal Nottingham. 
not so much the Empire, Nottingham, I don't think she was mad keen on variety. I think uh, some of the, the Max Miller stuff she tried to avoid quite a lot, you know, for her young child. I remember we went to holiday to, on holiday to Margate once, and um, a, a fella gave himself uh, of the, the great song, uh, I can't get my winkle out, isn't it a sin? The more I try to get it out, the more that it stays in. And my mother actually blocked my ears. But of course, I understood exactly what it was all about. Well, you would do coming yeah. from Nottingham, wouldn't you? Exactly. It was about, it was about shellfish, and uh, and I'm a liar as well. And uh, but in the most tangible way, so far as music was concerned, she put me to a, a lady called Veronica Brown, who uh, was a piano teacher, is a piano teacher, and bless her heart, this Veronica Brown uh, gave me a real taste for piano playing. And uh, because I suppose there was even in, at that time, at the age of six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, all those sort of years, a desire to be a performer, I, I couldn't wait to get rid of the scales and start the pieces. And uh, I loved it when I was actually able to play a tune and to play it to people. And I, I, I won a scholarship uh, to the Royal Academy of Music in London, which is the reason we moved from Nottingham to London. And we moved at the end of the war in 1945. Well, in fact, before the end of the war, uh, because uh, there's a story I, I could tell you, I will tell you if you like, about uh, being evacuated to the Isle of Bute. We moved from Nottingham to London in order that I could accommodate this scholarship at the Royal Academy of Music, because it didn't matter actually where. Uh, my father sorted letters, and uh, my mother was a housewife, and it didn't matter where she was a housewife. They were, uh, they very graciously decided that my future was more important. So we decided to move to where Auntie Bunty, the one who'd married Fraser Wood, you're still following this saga, are you? I'm trying, Leslie, I'm trying. Yes, you are, very, and succeeding immensely well. And, uh, well, she, they'd sold Spring Hill and they'd moved to Richmond in Surrey, you see. <laughs> Complicated, this is. So we decided we would come down to London, come on down to London, and... Uh, sort out a place to live near the Royal Academy of Music. And we cycled down. We cycled down from uh, Nottingham to London. It's 120 miles. Oh, I know. I know. We, we cycled down on the A5 and mm. it took us a whole day from 6am to about 10 o'clock at night. Such was uh, my mother's resolve. My father uh, very wisely stayed at home uh, sorting letters and uh, other people's letters, and uh, we we flogged our way down to London, stayed with Auntie Bunty and uh, Fraser Wood, and eventually found this house in Twickenham. But uh, we arrived just in time for the buzz bombs and the V2s. Good timing, wasn't it, really? And one of the buzz bombs, uh, while we were walking along the towpath at Richmond in Surrey, decided to follow us and, and stopped uh, just in front of us. Now, if they stop overhead, so their downward slant means that it would, have, it would have gone beyond us, you see, and we'd have been all right if we'd stayed stock still. But as it stopped in front of us and we could see it, we knew it was coming straight for us. Well, a zephyr wind blew it to the right, and it uh, landed on the other side of a, a 17th century wall, part of the old palace at Richmond. Destroyed part of the old palace. Uh, but the wall saved us. And my mother picked herself up, and me too, and we decided the time had come, or she decided the time had come for us to leave the area for a time until hostilities had ceased, uh, which uh, didn't look as though it was going to be all that long because we landed in Normandy then. And uh, I said, we landed in Normandy. Others had done it for us. <laughs> and uh, so we, uh, my mother went to the evacuation authorities. Now, that part of the war, there was no way that they were going to subsidise, and we hadn't got any money, there, were no, there was no way they were going to subsidise train fares or whatever. You had to... They would only subsidise you if you could prove that you knew an address where you wanted to go. So that they, 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 they only subsidised the fare and they didn't subsidise the, the digs when you got there, as it were. So my mother went to the local post office and took out a directory, telephone directory for West Scotland. And she took a pin out of her hat and she stuck it in the first page she opened. And she stuck it into the name and address of William Ritchie Hilton Farm, Rothsey Butte. And she went to the evacuation authorities and says, we know him at this address. 
and they gave us the train fare. So we went up to Hilton Farm, Rothsey Butte, and uh, we, we flogged our way all up the, the half mile from, from Rothsey Airport, down round in Ellen Bay, and up to Hilton Farm, knocked on the door of this man and said, who the hell are you? And uh, my mother said, uh, we are your evacuees for the duration, and produced the piece of paper that uh, um, supported her statement. And this fellow said, well, do you make good apple pie? Because I'm a bachelor. And my mother said, yes, I do, and she did. And uh, that was uh, that was the sort of audition over, and we and we and we went we went in, Richard, and, and that was it. And we were there for about five months until the war in Europe finished, and then uh, came back to Twickenham. Was father still sorting? He was sorting. Um, my father was an alcoholic and uh, was therefore uh, rather sadly unable to control much of his own destiny, never mind anybody else's. He was a super fellow, but he just had this disease. And um, indeed, in the last years of his life, when my mother died, we had to look after him virtually, and, uh, when Jeannie and I were first married. We, we'd hardly been married for a year when he died, but uh, certainly when my mother died, when I was 19, until I got married at 21, and he died at the, the end of that year, as it were, I got married when I was 21. Um, he, he had to be more or less looked after by us. Right, we have digressed to Richmond and then to the Isle of Butte and then back to London. Um, have we covered, and you'll forgive me for saying that I've forgotten, your later formal education? Uh, well, no, you haven't covered it at all. And the funny thing about the later formal education was that, <coughs> I mean, if a, if a co-ed school is a formal education, it's certainly a bloody good one. So, you know what to be in, Richard? When we moved to Twickenham, um, I went to the Thames Valley Grammar School. And uh, while I was there, a guy called Norman Guest, a superb man, history teacher, cast me in the end of term school play, which he decided to put on, called Higgins, the High Women of Cranford. And such was my success. Sort of, yo I, was, I, I yodeled in the part, really, because my voice was breaking, and I, I think I must have sounded like a sort of cross between or, oh, I don't know, a man of gingold and a bull backing into barbed wire, you know, it was a very nasty sound, but I, I'd got this obvious desire to ham. And ham I did, and my parents came to see the show, and uh, my father made a, a decision uh, for once in his life, and he said, uh, yes, this boy should go to drama school. So I went to drama school. I went to the Arts Educational Schools, as it's called now, but was then called the Cone Ripman School, run by three ladies, Gracie, Lillian, Valerie Cone, and Olive Ripman. And it was primarily a dancing school with uh, dramatic attachments. And uh, that's why I like the ballroom dancing with Helen Cherry, is it? Can you tell me the names of any of your contemporaries there that we may know? Yes. You would know more of the dancers, really. Malcolm Goddard went on to become a very famous choreographer, a TV and stage choreographer. Keith Beckett, uh, who was one of the greatest Petrushkas of the 50s, I suppose, is now a, a very senior producer for Thames Television. Uh, Toots Lockwood, Margaret Lockwood's daughter. Some very, very good people. And I think the next thing on my list, and correct me if I'm wrong, we were going to talk next, I think, about school broadcasts for the BBC. Did that Was that a logical follow-on? Well, it could be, because uh, it was certainly the first work I ever did. You see, while I was at the Cone Ripman School, um, like most drama schools, they like to put their their creatures out into the uh, the big wide world, the wicked world of entertainment, of the theatre, because uh, they want to earn 10% from the earnings. Uh, and uh, r rather like the Italia Conti School and uh, all the others, the, the only ones who probably weren't doing this were the um, were Rada and Lambda but the the more commercially minded stage schools certainly love to do this and that is where if uh, the BBC producers in this case wanted a young actor to play the part of a young lad asking the teaching questions or the uh, the questions which became teaching answers in in potted plays or whatever for schools broadcasts. Then they approached schools like the Cone Ripman School. And I used to do music and movement for under 10s and senior English too and stories from world history and had that marvellous, I mean, 
it certainly taught me the, the fun side of show business and also the uh, the dedication because you, you used to turn up in the morning didn't have to learn anything of course you read from a script but you rehearsed furiously from about nine o'clock until eleven and then went on the air at two or something like that and if you if it was an early morning broadcast then you would uh, turn up the day before and rehearse and then and then do it the next day uh, that was at 1A Portland Place and uh, they were marvellous days actually great producers George Dixon, Sam Langdon, Charles Mason and you had the opportunity of course to work with actors who had turned to radio as a, a sinecure if you like because there was the BBC Repertory Company marvellous actors like Richard Herndl and Connell and Hobbs and Norman Shelley and great, great actors and to to observe them and the economy of their performance mm. and the, the the more economical that they were the more telling was their performance what did this lead to next Leslie well uh, I won a, a, a scholarship oh no I didn't sorry I won the drama cup with a girl called Margaret Ann Wedlake at uh, the Cone Ripman School and one of the adjudicators gave me a letter of introduction to Robert Atkins at the Open Air Theatre Regent's Park. So when I was uh, 16, oh. I appeared, uh, uh, I got, got, the, got the, the job following the introduction. And I played third watchman in Much Ado About Nothing at the Open Air Theatre in 1949 with uh, the other two watchmen, numbers one and two, being Henry McGee and Andrew Gardner. So the three of us eventually did fairly well and it was lovely those days in the park were wonderful by now was the future intent positively settled well yes I mean I knew I was going to be a, a performer of some kind and I at that time I, I thought I was going to be a character actor but it very soon transpired that I was going to be a, a, a character comedian or try and make people laugh because in 1949 the, the, the third production we did was um, a Midsummer Night's Dream, and I played uh, Thisbe. Uh, that's Flute the Bellas Mender, one of the rude mechanicals, as you know, in Midsummer Night's Dream, who plays Thisbe in the play scene. So I suppose my first comedy part was in drag, because it's the story of Pyramus and Thisbe, and Thisbe is the lead here. And uh, I got my first laugh, and I remember the thrill, the first laugh professionally. The thrill of getting that laugh was just absolutely fantastic. I did an audition for. Uh, a review on radio uh, called Action on Youth. I think I was mm. 17, 18 then. And uh, the writers for that, I got that job, played all the character comedian parts, the funny voices. You had to be under 21 to be in that show. Unless you were Michael Myers, he was presenting. He was two years older than God, of course. And uh, <coughs> always. And um, he spoke very well of me, too. And. <laughs> Oh dear, and uh, the writers for that show, two of the writers were uh, Alec Graham and uh, Peter Myers. And they were writing Club Theatre Review, uh, which was called Intimate Review. And the club theatres would now be called Fringe Theatres, but it's the same idea. And they were writing the sort of beyond the fringe bit of its mm. time. And um, they, they were putting on shows and they put on a show at the Notting Hill gate, the new Lindsay Notting Hill gate, and that was a cast, all young hopefuls, uh, Peter Felgate, Dillis Lay, Eunice Gason, Ron Moody, Ronnie Stevens, uh, Ian Carmichael, Patrick Cargill, Joan Sims, and me. If you can put your finger on the first thing for which you seem um, clearly remembered, it's the folder rolls, I think. Would you like to talk to us about this? Yes, I'd love to talk about the folder rolls. Um, I suppose that is what I'm clearly remembered for. In point of fact, uh, Dillis and I had already won uh, an accolade in the Daily Mirror from the, the then uh, radio critic who said that we were only a mile away from the West End, which caused all the people who lived in Twickenham to say, well, that's a lie for a start, you're 12 miles away. They didn't realise the implication of the remark. Yes, I suppose, basically, uh, it wasn't until I, I, I joined the Folder Rolls that, however much one was a, 
uh, a star in fringe theatre until you actually went into the big wide world of the the overt professional theatre. Then, of course, you didn't begin to learn your trade because uh, you were really playing to specialised audiences in, in, in fringe theatre. I mean, you could do the satirical stuff that only a few people can understand, whereas you wanted to touch the hearts of the many to be a commercial success. And uh, I went into the Folderos, which uh, was a very well-known concert party. In the days when concert party was, was the king in seaside resorts, you did three changes of well we did three changes of program um the theory being and we changed every thursday the theory being that um if you went to see a uh, to holiday in scarborough say where we played a lot or eastbourne or torquay or hastings for a, a fortnight you could see all three shows if you like the first one on the, the saturday when you booked in you could book in the following whenever and the following whenever and see all three mm -hmm. and i learned there how to move uh, even tap dance a bit. I learned how to to sing in tune, and I learned how to be a feed. I learned how to be a, a stand-up comic, or I started to learn. I mean, you never finished learning that. Uh, how to be a stand-up comic and also to be in sketches and, and what, uh, everything. You talk about learning every um, every wrinkle, as it were, of the trade, and it's quite clear that you've been in the business and around the business long enough to have done the greater part of that. So what is your view of these people who come forward, they have a pop record, and they are overnight an actor uh, and a film star? Well, if they last, then um, and I think it argues that they must have had a little more preparation than we think. I mean, if you take somebody like Phil Collins, uh, first of all, he is a very gifted musician and a very pleasant singer and uh, was in a group called Genesis for uh, Caroline, one of our daughters, was working recently for Peter Gabriel, who's got a superb recording studio in Box, just the other side of Bath, just about the same distance the other side of Bath as we are this side. And... Uh, oh, my uh, you can tell, I mean, the, the innate musicality of the man uh, and the professional musicality of Phil Collins stood him in good stead, obviously there, so there was a lot of background there before they made their first hit. And, of course, they made um, dozens. Uh, when he decided to take up acting, I think it must have been a, a step that he thought of for a long time. Not, but nearly everybody's a, a good natural actor. But uh, it depends whether they can translate that into professional terms, and he's obviously managed to do it. I think what you mean is that the person who has an overnight success and, and, and comes from nowhere, how long do they stay there? That's the thing. How long did those two miners stay there who came up and, and sang successfully for a couple of years? Where are they now? Uh, I can think of lots of people who've come and gone, but the ones who have stayed are the ones who either had an apprenticeship that we know about or an apprenticeship that we don't know about. Also, while we're digressing, um, you talk about continuing to learn about being a comic. And even though we sit here in your lounge uh, doing this very ordinary interview, um, it comes very quickly to the surface. Um, so tell us the truth, because maybe the listeners won't know this. When I've gone and you are sitting in this lounge with your wife tonight, will your attitude to life be the same as it appears to me now? Yes, I'm learning all the time to be uh, honest. And I think it's a very, it, it's a, with myself, and I think it's a very great uh, attribute. And I think lots of people are honest all the time. It's very difficult in show business to be honest all the time because you spend so much of your time being a commercial extension of yourself or somebody else if you're a character actor or if you're an actor. So uh, I shall carry on uh, exactly the same as we are now. So will you answer her with the same sort of immediate quips that you have thus far answered me with several times? Uh, yes, there'll be different quips and um, because we understand each other so well, having lived together for so long, um, there will be a, a mutual acknowledgement of the uh, of the kind of sense of humour that we've got. F the, funnily enough, 
what we accept as normal conversation between us is probably totally bizarre to other people. When and where did you meet your wife? We met when uh, I was at the Cone Ripman School, the drama school and dancing school and ballroom dancing. We met when I was there because uh, Jean came from Bristol uh, and won a scholarship as a dance student and, and, and drama. And I'd won a scholarship to be a drama student plus the dancing. And we met, uh, she referred to me as the callow youth. I forget what I called her. Probably best not say. Well, I probably best forgotten. It can't have been that bad because uh, the grievance hasn't been nurtured or nursed <laughs> since. And then, funnily enough, we kept on meeting because when, while we were at the school, we both became part of the Ovaltini's Concert Party of the Air, which Clarence Wright, late of Itmar, and uh, uh, don't forget the diver, sir, and all these things, uh, or the, all the characters <coughs> he was responsible for in that wonderful wartime show that Tommy Handley started. He had decided, or he'd been given the job, to uh, reproduce and revive the Ovaltini's Concert Party. So Jean and Leslie became the stars of that concert party while we were still at the, the, the school. Um, and that went out on, on Radio Luxembourg. We recorded it in Abbey Road, the same studios that recorded the Beatles and Tommy Beecham and the Royal Philharmonic. So we were in plenty of good company, I'll tell you. God, blimey. And uh, then we both left the school at roughly the same time. And uh, by then our, our friendship had become fairly serious. And we met again, God bless us, uh, at the Open Air Theatre Regent's Park in the 1951 season uh, when they revived Midsummer Night's Dream and Jean was head of the dancing troupe at uh, the fairies. And uh, I wasn't, I'm pleased to say. And uh, I was again giving my Thisbe in the Midsummer Night's Dream. And then, blow me down, we met again in a show called Accent on Youth that Michael Miles was hosting. And Jean and I were both involved in that uh, sporadically. So then we decided to get married, and that was it really. When were you married and where? We were married in Canesham, spelt K-E-Y-N-S-H-A-M, thank you Horace Bachelor, in 1954 at uh, St John's Church. And we've actually, uh, of course, moved back to the area, or aerial, as they say down here, the same aerial where, where Jean was born. Since your uh, wife was a Somerset girl, and so was mine, can I ask you if you also, for the first few months, needed an interpreter? Well, <laughs> oh no, only for the relatives, uh, because because Jean by that time had got um, most of her accent knocked out of her at drama school, at the drama side of the dancing school. You see, it was all she left the web, she left the loom, she made three paces through the room, she saw the water lily bloom, she saw the helmet and the plume out, around, and about, not a rained and abate. And uh, the A sound was very quickly dispatched to the uh, confines, and, uh, and by the time I got to know her, the A sound was very, very much in the background. So uh, I did understand every word she said. But what I find a little incongruous is that my wife only needs to come back down here for about three quarters of an hour, and she's as bad again. Has your, is your wife the same or not? No, she's not, but what? But Jean's in, one of Jean's endearing habits, uh, which I've learnt to look upon as endearing, I must say, didn't originally fill me with horror, was that when we were on tour, especially in Scotland, because the, the Falderals used to do winter tours of Scotland, we'd come back and Jean would suddenly be talking like this. And I said, you don't talk like that. She said, like what? I said, you don't talk like that, love. Talk. She said, I am talking, you know. And all this went on. She'd drop it very quickly, but she did pick up the accent and the flavour of where we lived. When we went to America, um, she started to just begin to talk like that, but uh, I quickly discouraged that with a firm, don't talk like that. Children? Yes. What about them? <laughs> oh, come on, you're going to do better than that I do now. Yes, and I have done. I have done it, so has Jean, producer extraordinaire. Uh, yes, we got five children um, and seven grandchildren. Uh, Liz uh, Crowther is um, a well-known actress. She's had some very good parts on television and uh, radio and in rep all over the place. So she's a, full, uh, a fully established actress, unmarried. 
Lindsay, her twin sister, uh, has produced four of our grandchildren, is a housewife and mother, and is very involved in the Christian church in Hastings with her husband Peter. Uh, Caroline is uh, remarried, uh, having originally married dear lovely Philip Lynott, who died so tragically, as you know, and whom we remember with great affection and uh, respect. The priest who officiated at his funeral called him the father of Irish rock. It's a lovely, lovely epithet for somebody. The father of Irish rock. It's lovely, isn't it? For one so young, you know, mild. Anyway, he, when he uh, tragically died, uh, uh, Caroline and, the, and their two children uh, struggled. Well, they didn't struggle on, of course, because uh, uh, they were all right, apart from being heartbroken. Yeah. Uh, but she has recently married again, and it's all going wonderfully well, and we love David, and it's great. Uh, Charlotte is happily married to a guy called Adam Calkin, who is a brilliant interior designer and decorator. Get your bookings in now, folks, if you want your house redecorated. He's absolutely brilliant. I mean, unbelievable. He does all that marbling and, uh, uh, what, what do you call it, trompe l'oeil deception of the eye paintings, you know, that make you look as though you're walking into a room and it's just a blank wall with his lovely designs on. Brilliant. And uh, Nicholas uh, has just got a, an honours first in fine arts, which we're thrilled about. So he, uh, he really has got a degree, an honours first, in fine arts at the Newcastle upon Tyne University. He's married to a lovely lady called Claire. They live in North London. And uh, that's it. How extol the virtues of the grandchildren? Oh, well, I mean, they're all wonderful, of course. And uh, they, the, the ones who live near us, that's Sarah and Kathleen, that's Caroline's too, uh, have uh, had a, a tree house built for them by their grandfather. Fancy that. Nearly cost me my life, I might tell you. God, blimey. It's it, it's four foot by, by eight feet. That's a hell of a floor size, isn't it, for a tree house? And it's six foot high. I can stand up in it. And it's five foot off the ground on these dirty great oak posts, which cost a fortune. They're five by five by seven foot deep, two feet of which is concreted massively into the ground. And, uh, and supporting the... The, the floor of the tree house. The branch, of course, flirts harmlessly underneath. I wasn't going to trust that branch, <laughs> not with my grandchildren. And uh, it's lovely. Let's talk for a moment about uh, The Price is Right. The Price is Right, yes. Oh, uh, sure. For years, people have asked me why I had never been a game show host. And uh, the answer was very simple. Nobody had ever asked me. <laughs> and then in 1984, <coughs> Uh, I was asked if I would, if, uh, William G. Stewart asked me if I would be the game show host of The Price is Right. <coughs> and the funny thing about The Price is Right, of course, is that um, the last thing I did on television, w uh, which was widely known, had a catchphrase come on down. And the first thing I did on television, which was widely known, had a catchphrase, Cracker Jack. Which Friday is five to five and it's Cracker Jack. So, uh, it, uh, it, it's quite amazing that at uh, one end of my career and towards the sort of last knockings of it, not yet, uh, but towards that end, years before the end, said he hopefully, we have catchphrases at either end. I love The Price is Right. It, it was a, a real challenge. It was an acting part, really. I acted the part of a, I mean, I was me, but I was actually acting the part of a game show host. Can you understand that? I'm not altogether sure that I could understand it, but I, I rather liked it. Uh, and when I say that, I don't mean that in a patronising fashion. My, my wife loved it. I, I didn't see it as often. I rather enjoyed it, but I think that if I had a query about it, it would be that it... Were the audience in any way um, directed? No, not in any way. We, uh, they arrived in a state of hysteria. Because they arrived, you see, for, to these central television studios in East Midland Studios in Nottingham. And that was, again, lovely playing at home, you know. <coughs> uh, they arrived from places like Inverness and uh, Land's End and Kent and uh, Lancashire, Yorkshire, Warwickshire, by coach. So by the time they got to the studio, they were in a state of flux. 
And uh, indeed, on one occasion, we had to ask them to be a little less noisy because the sound engineers couldn't cope with the noise. Um, they were encouraged to participate by shouting out advice to the, the people who had been chosen from their party, as it were, who would turn round in desperation and say, what do you think? What do you think it should be? Five or six or whatever. They go, oh, I don't know. And scream and yell. And in that respect, it was a bit like a pantomime. It was a, you encourage an audience in a pantomime to participate in the show. Well, that's all we did. OK, well, if we, if that is the case, then let's turn it the other way around and say, did you ever find yourself in difficulty with a subject who was perhaps reticent to uh, come on down, as it were? Well, no, I mean, they were never reticent to come on down. They were sometimes reticent where I, I think the idea of winning a prize uh, made them come on down, even if they were were on crutches, you know, they'd, they'd get there. No, I, I, I think the, the, the reticent ones who suddenly became shy when they realised that they were facing the audience that they'd just deserted to go to the centre of the studio were, uh, were allowed to be shy. I mean, if a shy person is a shy person, then they're a shy person and that's all there is to it. All I had to do was make sure they weren't nervous as well. And uh, I think the prime uh, thing for a, a game show host to be is uh, communicative, get on with it, um, paper the, through the cracks if there are any, make sure the contestant feels at home, isn't nervous and understands the rules of the game. Once you've done that then you, you've cracked it. In comparison to other work that you've done, how difficult or easy was that job? Well it was like, a, as I say, it was like an acting job because uh, I had to learn the rules of 34 different floor games most of which were fairly similar but with a different architectural basis as far as the game was concerned. But I actually had to learn the rules. I mean, for instance, if, I, if, if we were playing the dice game, I had to say to them, right, uh, the, the, the price of that prize is a three-figure sum. Within that three-figure sum, there are no noughts, no number is hard and six, and no number is repeated. We're going to throw the first of the dice with the first of the three figures. If it's right, we'll let you know straight away. If it's wrong, I want you to tell me if the number you've shown on the dice is higher or lower, or the, the number you think is the first number in the in the prize is higher or lower than the number shown on the dice. We do this with all three dice, with all three numbers. At the end, I tell you whether you won or lost. Now, the, there's, there's quite a bit of uh, basic intelligence needed to win, because you've got to assimilate those rules straight away and work out, I mean, for instance, if you if you throw a one and it's wrong, then you know that the first number can only be high because there are no noughts and so on and so forth. So you, you've got to use some kind of basic logic in order to try and win that prize. How long did you do that job? Five years. If they ask you to do it again tomorrow, would you do it? Oh yes, I think I would. Uh, it depends where and in what context. At the moment it's on Sky Television and they're doing it half an hour every day as opposed to an hour once a week. And I think it might be uh, uh, debating the coinage slightly. So I know I don't. I don't think I'd want to do it. Um, but if they if they went back to doing it once a week and made it an hour's show at peak time and asked me to do it again, yes, I would. What is there left for you to do now, if one said you had a preference? Uh, well, carry on working, basically, because that's what I'm I'm in the business for. Funnily enough, somebody once I, I asked Arthur Askey once. So when he was in his 70s, I said, why the hell are you carrying on working? He said, because that's what I got off my bottom for from my accountant's uh, uh, assistant's seat in Liverpool all those years ago. And it's the only thing I know. Uh, it, I don't think it's the only thing I know, but it's, it's work-wise, it's the only thing I want to do. And uh, I'm in a very privileged position of being, A, not touting for the work at the moment, and B, uh, being able to pick and choose. And one of the things I did recently, for instance, was a, a, a concert performance of A Midsummer Night's Dream, going back to my uh, performing roots, as it were, uh, with the City of Birmingham Symphony Orchestra at the Town Hall in Birmingham. And that's one of the best orchestras in the world, as you know. And uh, we did a concert performance with scripts, with that wonderful music of Mendelssohn's, behind us and the combination was electric, absolutely electric. So that 
Although one doesn't get paid a fortune for that, I'd have paid to do it. Uh, so that uh, I, I am in a fortune. I just want to. I just want to be able to be given the chance to keep on working. So you don't really mind in what field? Well, no, there are so many fields which are interesting, you see. One of the great fields at the moment is conferences. Um, I've just done one for a, a Nottinghamshire firm, Crooks, which is a subsidiary of Boots, chemists, um, in, in uh, Bournemouth, and that was great fun. And you learn so much about another part of the world of business. I, I mean, bus uh, another kind of business as opposed to show business. Leslie, will you ever retire? Well, that's a very difficult question. Um, I mean, if I if I had to retire, because nobody asked me anymore, then of course I would, and I would do it without any uh, rancor, because uh, obviously a, a dog must have his day, and uh, you only have your allotted span to run, and popularity wanes, and all that sort of thing. <clears throat> but I would I, I would love to become in, uh, involved in some kind of uh, show business because that's what I love. And uh, is this home, with these beautiful views across the Somerset Valleys, going to be your home until you die? Absolutely. This is where they're going to carry us out of the coffin. Well, before we get to that... <laughs> okay. uh, Long before. <laughs> um, social life and people in the business. Uh, do you socialise with people in the business, people out, or both, and to what extent? Well, both, really. I mean, we have great friends within the business who are... Lots of our greatest friends are relations. All genes, I hasten to add, or mostly genes, because uh, nearly all mine have snuffed it. But uh, there's my cousin Wally and his wife Pat, and we're great mates with them. And uh, all genes relatives are, are superb people. And we have friends in the world of antiques, which we collect, as you can see, if you look around the walls. In fact, they fall on top of you if you're not careful. Don't move too quickly, will you? And uh, it's a sort of Victoria and Albert Museum gone mad in this house. And uh, we have friends, lots of friends in show business. Yes, we do. Ronnie Barker's a great friend. For instance, Sylvia Sims is a great friend. We have many, many. Brian Ricks and Elspeth Gray are great friends. We even go on holiday with Brian and Elspeth. I mean, that's how friendly we are. Right, the penultimate question, and not as morbid as it might sound, were you to be dispatched tomorrow, yeah. what yeah. would you... And let, <laughs> well, this is a miserable question. Oh, it's a lovely question. <laughs> no, if, I, if I can manage to get the rest of it in, then. Um, what would you choose most to be remembered for? Uh, that, again, is a very difficult question, but the, one or two highlights, certainly. I'd, I'd love to be remembered for... Uh, being, a, I think, a fairly definitive Chesney Allen in the life story of Flanagan and Allen uh, with Bernie Winters on television. Okay. We did that in 1981 and it got uh, tremendous acclaim, not only from the, the punters, but uh, the viewers, but also from the critics, which is a thing I haven't always been uh, well known for. Critical acclaim hasn't always come my way. But they certainly all ganged up and decided that was all right. <clears throat> and it, it felt marvellous to do it. I mean, it was a combination of, the ideal combination, really, of uh, acting and vaudeville. And that was lovely. One of the other things is a situation comedy I did called My Good Woman with Sylvia Sims in the early 70s, which people have seemed to have forgotten. It, 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 the funny thing about television, and I suppose it's only, it can, it, it's only to be expected, that they... The, the viewer really only remembers you for what you did last. And if the thing I did last uh, that they remember is a game show, then I'm a game show host. But I'm not just that. I'm a stand-up comedian. I'm also an actor. I'm also a cabaret artist. Uh, and they wouldn't know that unless they saw me in camera, of course. And I'm also a situation comedy actor on television. And it, it, it's amazing that... Um, that all, that all those things have happened, and yet the, the, the thing they seem to remember most, and believe me, I'm not crying stinking fish, because I can, I can see every reason for, for their decision. Because television actually gives you a very short memory, there's so much of it, that the last thing you remember about a person is what they did last. Amazing. Isn't it? The final question, then, and one that I ask almost all my guests, 
If you were to have taken from you every memory you had bar one, and you were permitted to keep only one, would you like to share with us that one which you would most especially keep? Yes, it would be my marriage. That would be the memory that I would I would most want to hang on to because uh, that has uh, been the the reason for all the work. I mean, if I hadn't met Jean, and if I hadn't got married to Jean, uh, and if we hadn't stayed together, then there would have been another reason <coughs> for continuing to work in show business. But because we have stayed together, and because I did meet her, and because we did get married, that is the reason, that is the reason for living, really. <laughs>